1860 and the Civil War was raging. And it was a time when medicine was still in the Dark Ages. There was no concept of a germ theory yet. A hospital is a place you went to die. A young woman, Lord. Ellen White, had a vision, she claimed from God, for a new understanding of health and healing. It became one of the cornerstones for a new American-born religion, the Seventh-day Adventists. Today, Adventists operate some of the nation's leading hospitals. One of the key ways that we thought we would make history is to create the community hospital of the future. Explore the latest medical technology. To the trained eye, he has an aneurysm right here. Expand on the pioneering work of infant heart transplants. Like we can take his heart out, put a new heart in. There's something miraculous about all that. Practice a body, mind, and spirit approach to health and healing. Even the curriculum in medical school is changing to incorporate a more holistic view. And the irony is that Adventists, who believe in the near end of the world, are now among the healthiest and longest living people on the planet. Well, I'm 98 years young. They live anywhere from 5 to up to 10 years longer. It's pretty exciting. About one hour east of Los Angeles is Loma Linda, California. It's an enclave for the Seventh-day Adventist Church with a world-class medical center and a university with a focus on health and medicine. Loma Linda came to world attention in 1984 when Dr. Leonard Bailey transplanted the heart of a baboon to save the life of a dying child, a child that became known as Baby Faye. At the time, the operation was highly controversial. Lynn faced some real opposition from our own campus. I mean, some people who weren't sure that we wanted to be this exposed, that we weren't sure this was the right way to go. And I credit for Lynn for keeping clear in the vision of where he was going. I do believe that the scars that Lynn got during this time have made him the gentleman that he is. Today, Dr. Bailey and Loma Linda surgeons perform as many as two dozen infant heart transplants a year. But Loma Linda and the wider Adventist community are making headlines again. There are about one million Adventists in the United States, and as many as 100,000 of them have been the subject of a number of long-term studies, supported mostly with federal funds, to understand why Adventists seem to enjoy a longer life expectancy. established that only about 10% of how long we live is dictated by our genes. The other 90% or so is dictated by our lifestyle. Dan so Buettner led a research project for National Geographic that turned into a best-selling book, The Blue Zones. It identified Loma Linda as one of a handful of locations around the world where people do in fact live longer and seemingly healthier lives. I was in collaboration with the National Institute on Aging and um, some scientists out of Harvard. They put us in touch with the people who run the Adventist Health Study, which is a gold standard NIH funded epidemiology study that follows tens of thousands of people for decades. And that study revealed that the Adventists who most strictly follow the suggestions of the church are living about a decade longer than their American counterparts. But it's not simply living longer. Can the later years also be happy and productive? Ellsworth Wareham is as close to a poster child for Loma Linda and the Adventist lifestyle as there is. He insists on doing many of his own home projects, but it's his day job that continues to amaze. At age 95, Dr. Wareham can still be found most days in the operating room, not as a patient, but as a critical member of a team performing open heart surgery. I was the primary surgeon until I was about 76. Then I started to assist. Some weeks I'll assist in five or six open heart operations. Uh, the matter of assisting, of course, is quite simple after you've been a surgeon yourself. And it's the easiest thing I do. 
Ellsworth Wareham was an icon when I was a medical student here 35, 40 years ago, and still is. And, but, but it's not his technical expertise as much as his person. If you're doing heart surgery and vascular surgery, you get to see the results of your eating habits. It appears now, if you're going to be interested in longevity and good health, there better be a strong emphasis of plant-based food. People oftentimes ask me about stress and its influence on coronary artery disease. It's a nice concept that stress <laughs> has caused me to have your coronary artery disease, but it most likely came off your plate. It is pretty accepted now in the medical community with all of the body of scientific research that has been looking at Adventists that they live longer than their peers. They live longer than the people who are living in neighboring towns and even people living next door to them. The initial studies of Adventists were looking at specific things in their lifestyle. They found that because they're vegetarian, they eat more nuts. So originally we were saying in the early 1990s, hey, let's all eat walnuts, let's all eat almonds, which is a good first step. But with the Adventists, it's much more holistic. It's their whole vegetarian lifestyle, which includes a lot of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. But it's also beyond that. They believe in a strong sense of community. Well, I'm 98 years young. I am blessed because I have a church family. Well, I think we're content. I think, that, I think contentment means a lot. Six, seven, give me four. Oh. They believe in exercise. Four, seven, five. I come five days a week. I don't eat meat. I haven't for close to 40 years. I am over 70, so well over 70 so <laughs> that's as close as you're gonna get <laughs> you get around people that don't smoke that don't drink you just get a different frame of mind we have a number of people who come for proton treatments and they come they while they're here the three months or however they come regularly many of them proton treatments for people mostly suffering some form of cancer who come to Loma Linda they stay for a month or longer for daily treatments in the proton accelerator, a revolutionary process that splits the atom to more precisely target cancerous growths. It's one of the paradoxes within the culture of Seventh-day Adventists. For on one end of the campus is the church for a religion founded by a 19th century woman, Ellen White, a religion that by its own description is rather conservative with a traditional biblical understanding of creation and a firm belief in Advent, meaning coming, and in this case, the imminent second coming of Christ. Yet across the same campus, Seventh-day Adventists are on the cutting edge when it comes to medical science and holistic health. I think what makes Loma Linda so unique is this attempt to ride the line between both faith and science, in which we actually see faith as complementing, directing, and strengthening science, not as something we're trying to put back or, or, or leave behind. Love one another, care for one another, forgive one another, support one another. It is all the way through the New Testament. What we take the Bible very seriously. I think that we are conservative as far as most people are, are concerned. Uh, we have a lifestyle that is conservative, not as conservative as it once was. Most people, when they hear about Adventists, they have the foggiest notion of what an Adventist is. I have to admit, I'm, most, I'm pretty ignorant about Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have heard of them, but I don't know their backstory at all. I don't think I have a clue. <laughs> we identify ourselves as Christians. We identify ourselves as Protestants. I've heard of them. I don't know what they stand for. Adventists don't drink alcohol, they don't smoke. Are you a Mormon? Are you the people that come knock on the door with the watchtower? No, we're not Mormons. Uh, what do you believe? Well, we believe that Jesus is coming again. I think they follow the Jewish tradition in saying that Saturday is the Sabbath. We've been described as a people, uh, ironically, expecting the soon return of Christ, and yet who are, are known for doing all sorts of things to try to improve life here and build it up in a positive way. That sense of building in a positive way is even more ironic, considering Adventists grew out of an historic event more than a century and a half ago that came to be known as the Great Disappointment. I then will have a vision, a vision from God. 
God. And he said, I was frightened and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, your wisdom belongs to the end of time. In the mid-19th century, a Baptist preacher, William Miller, traveled the country preaching that the second coming of Christ was close at hand. Tens of thousands believed he was right. The pivotal text that William Miller centered his apocalyptic lectures on was Daniel 8.14. Onto 2,300 days and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Cleansed! And he thought the sanctuary was the earth and it would be cleansed by the fires of the second coming. Miller's followers determined the cleansing would come on a single date, October 22, 1844. One of those who came to hear Miller speak was a young woman, Ellen White. And at that time, Ellen White, my great-grandmother, and the whole family went to hear him. They were all impressed. Uh, they were impressed by his sincerity, his knowledge of the Bible, his understanding of prophecy, and his ability to explain things clearly and, and succinctly. Described by the Holy Scriptures, cleansing by fire. As October 22nd approached, true believers prepared to meet their God. Farmers abandoned their crops and livestock. Shop owners closed their businesses. Others simply threw away their money. And that night people gathered and waited to be united with their God. But the next morning, Ellen White and the others awoke to a world unchanged. She believed with her whole heart that Jesus was coming. She writes in her own writings, I went home and I cried all night. I think the disappointment of those earnest believers knew no bounds. And, of course, mobs gathered about their places of worship to, to mock them and intensify their misery. And that term, the great disappointment, is, is widespread among Adventists. It was a reality that still exists, I think, within the community. It did not come. And that, I think, undergirds the whole idea of the importance of the body. God didn't come back but we've got one another, and God says he's with us in this body. As Ellen White sought to understand what the disappointment meant, she had visions. Over her lifetime, she is said to have had 2,000 visions, which Adventists believe came directly from God. Those visions would help chart a course for the new church. She would often faint on the floor, They'd put a pillow under her head, and she would be seemingly out of it. They would test, and the, they couldn't see that she was breathing. And then she would come out of these and start saying what she had seen. In 1863, she had what is known in, in my circles as the comprehensive health vision that outlined a deeper commitment and uh, to bodily health and an understanding of the close relationship between bodily health and spiritual wholeness. This vision on health was actually quite encompassing. It talked about a plant-based diet, it talked about the need for sunshine, about the need for exercise, cleanliness, about the need of reducing sugar and increasing uh, vegetables and fibers in the, in the diet. But for those early Adventists, this was a major lifestyle change, and even for Ellen White, I mean, her favorite food was meat and white bread. The vision came at a time when the life expectancy was just over 40, and doctors could get a degree with little or no study. The condition of medicine was appalling. Basically, it was buyer beware. If you went to the doctor, the most common prescription you were given often contained things like drugging, bleeding, leeching, and even prescribing of smoking if you had a problem with coughing. 
In fact, the most common prescription was when you begin coughing, smoke two cigarettes immediately. Medicine in the mid-19th century was based on adjusting the bodily fluids. Bleeding was a, uh, well, a, you know, if, if, if you got too much body heat, you know, you just bleed off a pint of the stuff. If that didn't work, you try two pints. And then also, uh, you could take medicines, often that can, in fact, generally contain both arsenic and mercury and they would definitely flush out your system, fore and aft. <laughs> no rich person in the 19th century went to, a, went to a hospital. They had a physician come to them. Because without germ theory, you died in a hospital. Despite the public's fear of health institutions, in 1866, three years after it formed, the new Adventist church opened the Western Health Reform Center in Battle Creek, Michigan. It became an instant success because so few people were dying. Soon, a brilliant young surgeon, John Harvey Kellogg, whose medical education was sponsored by Ellen White, became director. Kellogg changed the name to the Battle Creek Sanitarium, and over the next half century, built an empire around the evolving Adventist approach to medicine and healthy living. Kellogg is the man who chose the word sanitarium because what he wanted is a place where people come to learn how to get healthy and to stay healthy. People were getting fresh air, sunlight, patients who were taking walks, and he understood the benefit of the natural healing effects that were available in the environment, coupled the best of science with the best of what we can get naturally and really did something that revolutionized care in his day. Through the years, Kellogg's reputation as an eccentric personality was only enhanced by his passion for new ways to harness nature for diet and health. He experimented with heat treatments and hydrotherapies. Scores of celebrities came to Battle Creek, including President William Howard Taft, King Edward, inventor Thomas Edison, pilot Amelia Earhart. Kellogg Sanitarium was now the largest health institution in the world. These rich people came because they wanted to feel better. It was very pragmatic. Uh, we know that these Adventists can do what we can't get elsewhere. And this was a tremendous boon to the Adventist health work. Adventist sanitariums began springing up across the country. But when the Great Battle Creek Sanitarium burned to the ground in the early part of the 20th century, Kellogg wanted to rebuild it on an even grander scale. A rift developed between the powerful Kellogg and church leaders. In the end, John Harvey Kellogg, who patented a process for making peanut butter, is credited with helping to inspire a national exercise movement and who, with his brother, created a name synonymous with the breakfast food industry, broke from the church, but not before helping to put the Adventist approach to health and the creation of unique health facilities on the map. Florida Hospital admits 110,000 patients a year. We take care of uh, over a million patients in our outpatient settings and in our emergency rooms. And we operate on 150,000 people a, a year. We have become the largest admitter in the United States, the hospital that admits more patients than any other in the U.S., and also America's largest provider of Medicare services. Florida Hospital is not one hospital, but a system of seven campuses across greater Orlando. The newest project is a 400-bed wing that overlooks a lake to combine the healing power of nature with state-of-the-art medicine. It's called Ginsburg Tower, named for a key benefactor. Knowing it's a Seventh-day Adventist hospital and that my own particular faith is Jewish, I wanted to be sure that when you walked in the door, you were walked into a building whose professionals are here to cure you, not to convert you. There are more cardiac procedures done in this hospital than any place in America. And I also assume someday I'll be having my own heart attack and I, and I want to be right here at, uh, in this building. It's wonderful to have this hospital wing here. 
Hope to gosh, you never need it as a, as a patient. Very good. Hospital in America have faced one major problem. Nobody wants to go there. So how can you change the health of America if you're the last place people want to go and the first place they want to leave? It's just not a good way to go at things. And so we tried to create a place where we could heal the whole person throughout their whole life, both in sickness and in health. The idea of a hospital as a place in sickness and in health was built into the original design of one of Florida Hospital's most unique facilities, Celebration Health. Opened in the late 1990s, it's the health center for the community also known as Celebration. Originally designed by Disney as a model for the 21st century, Disney turned to the Adventists to partner with them in the creation and design for a new hospital embodied in the entire building from the architecture the feel of the place is all about wellness when you drive up to hospitals ordinarily you feel sicker than you already felt when you were actually coming in we wanted people to begin their healing experience or their health experience from the time they actually drove in and so when you look at the building you feel really more like you're in a spa versus being in a hospital just off the entrance what they like to call the front stage the focus is on staying healthy. There is a pool and a fitness center used by hospital patients, doctors, staff, and the wider community. But it's on the backstage where Celebration takes on the character of a traditional hospital. Here, the notion of community, central to most religions, is woven into the prescription for health care, as doctors often bring an entire team on morning rounds. We have a chaplain, we have our respiratory therapist, the dietary physical therapy, and it could vary between 10 to 15 to 20 people involved in the care. The team allows us to provide a more comprehensive care to the patient, you know, we can harness the skill of different people. And the notion of community also plays a role in how patients advance their own recovery. And this has all been scientifically shown that people do better when they're in a community. Um, we have become more isolated with our technology, but yet being able to interact with people, especially people who have gone through similar experiences as your own, give you feelings of hope. Our transportation service will help you get into the vehicle so you don't have to stress out about that. I was hoping you'd say that. Yeah. <laughs> I love my husband, but he's not exactly the most gentlest person. <laughs> when you see somebody who's had more extensive work than you have, and they're working twice as hard and not getting anywhere near like where you're at, you'd be embarrassed to not do something about it. All right. Yay! Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus doctors more and more starting to realize that there's a lot that they don't know about the human body. There's a lot that they don't know about healing. And I think that is where, you know, spirituality comes into play. You know, they know that if a patient feels connected to other people, that helps in their healing. But they don't understand well, what is the actual mode of action? What's, what's that doing to the immune system? And that makes them a little nervous. You know, they want to always know exactly how everything works. Maybe it's okay just to know that what it does makes that person feel good, relieves their stress, and that's enough. Linda Lynch is a chaplain at Florida Hospital. In a system that believes in the connection between body, mind, and spirit, her domain is the spirit, primarily for women and infants. It means she works with many of the expectant mothers. I think one of my primary roles is to put them at ease, to come as a spokesperson for the hospital, and in my mind, more than a spokesperson for the hospital, a spokesperson for, for God. And so my presence, hopefully my manner, is just to lend to the beginning calm so that they can begin. Tonight, Yolanda Robinson is about to give birth to her third child. Push hard in your body. That's the push. Good 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 push. Good
Oh, he's coming, cuz. Oh, yes, he Perfect. Is. Okay, darling. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, there he is. All right. Oh, hey, man. You Auntie Cuphead. Oh, my God. Get him. I'm trying to stop. Hey, hey. Oh, my God. Get him. Oh, my God. Welcome to our world. This really is a precious moment for every mom. If the mom is strong, if the baby is strong, they're leaving shortly, in, in less than 48 hours. But some births are more complicated. Nikki Floyd broke her back in an accident while 40 weeks pregnant. The baby is taken by cesarean section and brought immediately to the neonatal intensive care unit. When any of us see suffering in a child, it calls forth from us questions about what it is to be human. It calls forth our helplessness, our vulnerability to see the tiniest, most fragile, human beings still as works in progress. One pound, two pounds, three pounds. Very rarely do we have a baby in there that's regulation size that weighs six pounds or more. Oh, feisty Missy. Everything good. Everything is beautiful. She's doing really good. Oh, praise the Lord. What a miracle. To see her father that way, to see how touched he was, how profoundly moved he was, to see his daughter for the first time, because this face has never been revealed on the planet before. To be privy to the most intimate moments of individual lives it's always an astounding place, a place of wonder, body, mind, and spirit. You gonna wake up for your close-up? You gonna wake up? Wake up. Wake up. But sometimes those intimate moments can be very painful. A generation after baby Faye, Dr. Leonard Bailey oversees an intensive care unit where infants are waiting for heart transplants. While the procedure is never routine, the problem now is not expertise, but available donor hearts. So in the intensive care unit are both success stories and stories where the outcome is still uncertain, as one in four will die waiting for a donor heart. Seven years ago, Dr. Bailey transplanted the heart of Gael. Because of that operation, he is alive and well today. Someone picked up my heart. Someone picked up your heart? Do you know who is the doctor changing his heart? Hmm. The doctor Bailey? Yes. Today, in an extraordinary turn of events, Dr. Bailey and his team will operate on Gael's five-month-old brother, David, who is now in desperate need of a new heart, a heart that has yet to be found. And this particular baby has kind of reached the end of his rope. Uh, David has uh, begun to die by degrees now, and unless we can extend his waitlist time a little bit, I'm afraid we're going to lose him. Too many people say that this happened to us before. It's more easy, but it's uh, really it's not more easy. Every day he fights for his life. He's a fighter. How do you hand your baby over and then turn around and, and walk away? This is the day that they may be saying goodbye to their baby. Early in the operation, they did almost lose baby David. He is right on the edge. When you saw your kid, your baby is fighting every day for his life, he tried to tell me, please don't stop. Please don't be sad because I am fighting. We never give up. We never give up. I'm probably in the best shape I've ever been in my entire life. I run probably between 30 and 40 miles a week. Um, I bike 
I stay fit, I go to the gym, I watch what I eat. So Brett Troyer was surprised when his doctor called to give him his test results. He goes, two came back positive. He goes, you have prostate cancer. And the first words out of my mouth were, you're kidding me. <laughs> because I didn't expect it at 41. Cancer does not discriminate. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care how old you are. So Brett began researching the latest in prostate treatment and volunteered to be part of a high-profile procedure. Obviously, robotic in the United States these days, it's the way to go. 75% of all patients who have prostate cancer surgery have it done robotically. Dr. Vipul Patel from Florida Hospital's Celebration is one of the world's leading robotic surgeons. Today, the procedure he will perform on Brett Troya will be viewed by 500 physicians at a conference center in Orlando and by doctors in Italy and Korea. I'm outside the operating room. My console is now outside. The team is inside, the patient's there. We have all our, all our doctors, all our nurses. I find it much more relaxing, uh, much more uh, efficient to actually be outside. The key is really having better vision and having more dexterity in confined spaces. That was the problem with open surgery. It's very difficult to see the prostate. It was a bloody field. And it was very difficult to save the nerves responsible for continence, sexual function, and cure the cancer. So that was the question. Are we going to be replaced by these robots? Uh, maybe. Uh, look what happened with the military. And today we have 9,000 robots on the battlefield. A robotic surgery unit is a several million dollar commitment up front. We think very hard when it comes to a, a new technology. It has to have the possibility of changing health care forever to make it safer, simpler, and less expensive. And you're beginning to see the pubovesical or puboprostatic ligament come into view right there, just to the right of the midline. Here at Celebration, we train over 6,000 physicians a year in minimally invasive technique. When you have the experts here who love to teach and love to impart their knowledge, we lose nothing by sharing that. We've actually gained. And our job as surgeons is to continue to refine this technique. And I can tell you, 3,000 cases in, I'm still learning. And I think that's a brilliant, uh, brilliant display of it. I think we should all give him Thank a hand. Uh -huh. here. It's really a nice, nicely done job. I think the next one is remote surgery. Like, I'm getting more and more remote, but I'm still connected directly. When it will really work is when I can connect, like, from here to maybe Africa or Korea and they, they need a, someone needs a surgery and they want me to do it and I would connect. If Dr. Patel can perform five surgeries a day up to 20 a week and he could possibly do it on a patient in California from Orlando, all right. uh, I'm all for it all right. as long as they have a backup computer and one doesn't crash. <laughs> <laughs> morning. Morning. As you can see, we can see go from skin and get some of the muscle right down to the vascular system and the bones. And we'll cut the head off and we'll lower him down like so. This area right here, we have an aneurysm. So we can click that on, make that our center point. We go ahead and hit cube view and there's your aneurysm right here. Everything that I just showed you there, we did probably in less than 30 seconds. Normally, I would take six, seven hours and a couple of angiograms. And this patient's probably back at work or at home right now. Today, breakthroughs in medical technology take on many different forms. By combining a working knowledge of anatomy, computer software, and animation, Tom Krakus is able to provide doctors with a three-dimensional, non-invasive way to detect and solve more complex problems. Your CAT scan, when it goes, when it circles around you, it takes a slice out and turns it sideways, like a loaf of bread. We have multi-slice detectors on these scanners, so when it goes around once, it actually cuts you 64 times. The computerized technology allows us to render this 3D image. From a single workstation, Tom Krakus is able to post his discoveries on a computer network that serves the six hospitals 
and 50 locations that form the Adventist's Kettering Health System around Dayton, Ohio. At the turn of the previous century, Charles F. Kettering was one of the most gifted inventors. He had more patents to his name than anyone else other than Thomas Edison. Innovation in technology is an integral part of, of what Charles F. Kettering was all about. He was always looking for answers to problems that technology could solve. This patient is about to benefit from advanced imaging. He has an aneurysm of the aorta that can be life-threatening. And if it suddenly ruptures, he's going to lose all of his blood into his belly in a matter of a few minutes. And uh, more than half the time, he'll just die on the spot before he can get medical care. Well, the only way to treat this before we had the angiography suite would be to just open him up and do a major surgery. That would have a large incision. It would take weeks, maybe months to recover from that. And if we can do this all through just a catheter, he could actually go home later today. That's pretty amazing. William, we're going to take a picture. I need you to not breathe. Hold very, very still. But before the procedure begins, Dr. Schwartz maps out his strategy with the use of 3D imagery. With the 3D modeling, it really helps us plan what to do with the patient. And a lot of times, it can cut down on other procedures and unnecessary work. I have physicians that tell me when we do the 3Ds, they are excited because they can now be far more precise. And when you see them concentrating on that image, their foremost element of mind is you do no harm. Here's your diameter just beneath the renal. Save that. So what he's doing directly impacts the care of a patient and what decisions the physician's ultimately going to make about their care. We could be better than that. You're, it's fun and you're helping people. It's great. The unfortunate thing about heart disease and with the, the majority of patients I see that this could be completely prevented with proper education and changes to lifestyle. When patients come in and I start talking to them about their lifestyle, at first, when I go in and talk to them, the first thing I say to them is, I won't ask you to do anything I don't do myself. And they breathe a big sigh of relief, thinking, oh, that won't be so bad. And then I start telling them that I'm a vegetarian, and I run six miles at least four days a week. I don't smoke, I don't drink. For physicians, the technology and the rate of information is just so fast that it's almost impossible to keep up. And so if people ask me, do you want to choose someone who's very technically competent and very up-to-date or someone who's compassionate, I say, I want both. Because if you're committed to the patient, you're going to read up on the latest technology and how you can provide that in a skilled way to the patient who needs that. You know, when you're a doctor, you touch people when they're hurting and you have an audience that really needs hope and healing and good news, someone to care, someone to help them feel better. Anytime you touch a patient's life, it's sacred. Life is sacred. I think the work is sacred because the work takes as its fundamental premise this idea that every human being matters. Every human being is sacred, has rights to care, rights to compassion and generosity that human beings are capable of. Why, are, why do those rights exist? They exist because we believe that God regards every human being as having sacred value. On the other side of the Kettering campus is the church, where people gather for Saturday Sabbath worship. By embracing the Seventh-day experience of the Sabbath, we exhibit our solidarity with the original Testament of Scripture and with the heritage of the Hebrew people. So what happened was Adventists became convinced that the right day for Christians to keep was not Sunday, the first day of the week, but the seventh day of the week. Sabbath would be an affirmation of creation. God rested at the end of creation and that enjoyed and took delight in what he made. That means the world is good, it's valuable, it ought to be affirmed and cared for. God's plan of 24 hours of sacred time is absolutely necessary for the human to fully thrive. It is the common knowledge that we share
that every week we will put things aside, differences, and come together. There's something special about that rest where you say, okay, I am free today not to do laundry, free not to go to work, not to clean the house. This is a day that we worship and then we celebrate with our families. At this church and a growing number of congregations, a faith community nurse uses the day of gathering as an opportunity to provide health programs or simply take the pulse of their parishioners. In the past, churches used to be the place of healing. That's where people would come for healing. Deaconesses in the early churches were the people that um, did healing and were concerned about people with health issues. And as the years went by, somehow the church kind of lost that focus on healing. So one of the things that faith community nurses do is try to have the churches reclaim that ministry of healing. Deep in our history is the whole concept that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and they belong to God, and we ought to care for them. Plato famously said that the body is the prison house of the soul. And that notion that somehow the soul is an ideal and the body is somehow a case in which the soul resides and that the relationship is kind of an unhappy relationship because the body pulls you down, that has affected the Christian tradition. We take the body to be essentially good. We may do bad things with it, but in its essence it is good. It is a gift of God. It may be related to another aspect of Adventist belief, and that is the fact that uh, human beings are essentially physical. That is to say, there is no part of us, like a soul or a spirit, that uh, lives independently from the body. So we are physical beings from beginning to end, and the future beyond death is a resurrection of the body. It's not an immortal soul that keeps on living. So once you've emphasized the body to that degree, then you begin to realize that taking care of the body is an extremely important thing to do. You had a birthday this month, didn't you? Yes. How old are you now? 91. 91. Okay. Are you on any blood pressure medication? No. No. Okay. You have to get older for that. Millie Mills is 92. And besides walking at least three miles a day, she has one more secret to a long life. I don't eat anything that has a mother. I think the Adventists are different when it comes to community in that this notion of a Saturday Sabbath um, sets them apart a little bit from everybody else. And because they're set apart, they tend to hang out more together. They tend to hang out with people with the same schedule and the same ideas. So this idea of eating a plant-based diet is reinforced. Ellen White also talked about that the diet that God gave Adam and Eve in Eden was the best. You didn't kill animals because there was no death. So you ate fruit, grains, nuts, and vegetables. Not much more than four decades ago, about 25% of Americans were overweight or obese. Now it's close to 70%. And most of that increase has been in the last 20 years. And the group that's actually growing the fastest is the morbidly obese. And by definition, that's people who are more than 100 pounds overweight. Dr. Heather Pena is a Harvard-trained physician at St. Helena Hospital in the lush wine country of Napa Valley, California. St. Helena is the oldest Adventist hospital, dating back to 1878. And in many ways, it recalls the original sanitariums by combining a natural environment with healing. Since its beginnings, the hospital has been supported by area vintners, some of the leading names in the wine industry, despite the fact that most Adventists don't drink alcohol. St. Helena is a traditional hospital with a leading cardiac unit, but there is a strong focus on the workings of the mind and its role in a person's overall health. Uh, yeah, actually, stuff really well stuff. There is a 29-bed psychiatric unit and a center for health that offers residential programs to help people overcome weight problems and a program to stop smoking that began in 1969 as one of the first of its kind in the nation. I probably started when I was about 12 years old and now I'm 52 and it's 
You know, I've had some medical issues where it's the light bulb has gone off and it's time to quit. What's the most important risk factor that you can change and improve a person's chances of being healthier and living longer? It is to stop smoking. It is the number one cause of avoidable death in this country. Show as a heavy smoker. Still. Yes, yeah, still. The brain is interesting in that it repeats behaviors for which it gets a reward. So, in my experience, people only are willing to change a behavior that gives them a reward when either life becomes so painful for them that they can't go on or they know that they're risking heart attack, stroke, you name it. It says that you've tried quitting 10 or more times. That's right, a lot of times, yes. 24 hours is, you know, kind of tough. It's brutal. I, I cannot now, at this point, make it a day. So what happens make it a day. when you stop smoking, how soon do you start feeling uncomfortable? Uh, immediately. It's very odd. Right. You know, there's that mind thing right, like right away when I make that decision. More and more we're finding related to addictive types of behavior. There's a brain chemistry aspect to all of these that we're just now beginning to understand and to address. It's a myth that nicotine is harmful. Nicotine is what keeps people using tobacco because it's more addictive than any other substance known to mankind. But nicotine by itself has not been shown to cause medical diseases. It's all the other chemicals that lead to the cancer, emphysema, coronary artery disease, and strokes. Good. Doing well. Your heart rate just reached the first target. Okay. So we achieved that. And your electrocardiogram looks great. So you're doing very well. Dr. Pena directs a weight control program called Transformation. Over 11 days of regular monitoring, lectures on diet and healthy eating, and exercise, people begin to make the changes in their lives that for many have become necessary. There are five things that if people do these five things, you can cut the risk of cancer by 70%. Cancer. And those five things are to exercise regularly, maintain your ideal weight, eat more fruits and vegetables, eat less red meat, and to not smoke. Now, how, what percentage of Americans do all five? Three percent. We need to focus much more on helping people accomplish those five goals. will make huge impact on the health in the United States. I've gained 50 pounds and had high cholesterol, high blood pressure, pre-diabetic, and I just wanted to get cleaned up. Literally gotten yourself We've analyzed now almost 400 people, and what we find is that the blood sugars drop about 12%, the blood cholesterol drops 15%, the triglycerides drop almost 30%. If you take the uh, combination of how we've helped folks with many addictions, such as drugs, alcohol, smoking, even weight loss challenges, there's over 20,000 people that have come through our programs here. When we think about helping people with addictions, it's all about giving them courage. I feel good. Here at St. Helena Hospital, we have uh, an inpatient psychiatric unit, 21 beds. We also have 39 beds dedicated to our St. Helena Recovery Center for the treatment of alcohol problems and drug addictions. The general statistics that come out of the uh, United States uh, Health and Human Services Agency as well as the National Institute for Mental Health uh, state that about one in four uh, adults in the United States has a defined uh, mental, mental issue, mental disorder, whether it's mild depression to anxiety all the way up to what we see in our hospital, major depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia.
Mental health, I would classify it as a chronic disease with acute episodes, very similar to diabetes. The mentally ill individual is coming into us with severe symptoms that we then manage on the inpatient unit, and then the expectation is that they'll be, uh, they'll work with their medications, that they'll go into therapy, uh, they'll get additional supportive treatment in their communities to manage this chronic disease. There's still some feelings that there's a volitional aspect, there's a self-control aspect to mental illness. If the person would only pick themselves up by their bootstraps, and that's not it at all. These are really chemical reactions in the brain as an organ that are creating behaviors that folks have a hard time controlling on the outside. This is really a disease. Our goal is to get the person out of the hospital and back into a more normalized life. Treatment works. Four months ago, Dr. Leonard Bailey performed an operation on baby David in the hope a donor heart could be found. Finally, the call came. It's a big day for uh, David. Doesn't get any bigger. The infant donors come from either sudden infant death or a lot of them do come from abuse, I'm sorry to say, in this country. And others come from innocent trauma. Every moment we're doing it, it's, it's participating in, in a miracle in, in one way or another. Just the fact we can stop his heart and it'll start again. There's something miraculous about all that. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. The fact that we can take his heart out put it in a bottle and put a new heart in is yet another miracle. Mi copa está rebosando. Ciertamente el bien y la misericordia me seguirán todos los días de mi vida, y en la casa de Jehová moraré por largos días. You know, every time we read this this song because uh it up uh, it don't talk about everything we feel no. But we just, we just read and we just, you know, take it in. <laughs> this is my baby's smell. My baby's smell, but if that's it, we, we try to do it here. When we found our groove in that offering room each day, it, uh, uh, there's a sense of mission there that uh, could only be described that way, I think. And the unique thing is that, that it has nothing to do with a specific religious belief. It's just sacred. So all the connections are done. Uh, they look fine. It's a good match. Well, that's what he needs. It's a good heart. But we would expect uh, David to do extremely well when this is all said and done. I know David's own parents are very, very grateful for this opportunity. We all need to have that faith in our lives, it seems to me, to be complete. But uh, you have to take it somewhere. The nice thing about health care is it translates into people's lives. Thank you for your help. Good job. We feel so happy. We feel it's a new chance, new opportunity, new life for everyone. Aww. Religions nowadays really are trying to emphasize how important it is to stay healthy. I think there is that sense there that there's a higher responsibility. It's not just to self, it's to a higher being. When you see the body as a gift from God, and you take the responsibility we have as human beings to involve responsibility for the body, it has very revolutionary impact on how I see my day when I wake up in the morning. America is learning how costly it is to live life with disease. It's very expensive, not very much fun, and it diminishes the potential that people have. I want to be able to skydive when I'm 80 with my husband. Following health rules is not about some legalistic thing that's in the Bible. It's because we will feel better our relationships will be better if we're healthy. Welcome home, baby. Let the body 
tengo. We try to share with everyone we know what happened in our life and the gift we have on our hands. Advent gives the future a kind of, of hope, of meaning, of possibility. It gives the future, in spite of all the other problems we may face, uh, something to hope for and look forward to. It says never give up. Hey! Yeah. And it says never give up. For more information, visit theadventiststhefilm.com. This program was made possible by a grant from South Central Nursing Homes, VersaCare, with an emphasis on health, dignity, and the search for knowledge, and the following.